But let's look uh, at some Blood Bowl teams. So there are loads of them. The rulebook has 21 in it. Uh, then there's a new corn team that was launched since the release of the current rules, um, and I actually just picked it up very recently, and I'm very much looking forward to using it. Um, then there's this uh, Teams of Legend PDF uh, here, which um, there's a link to this below as well. And these are official rules for six more teams from Blood Bowl's past that Games Workshop don't uh, have in their current miniatures range, and they have a bit of a thing about not releasing rules for models they don't sell, um, although they do give you a way to, to play with them uh, by releasing things like this. For, for teams that people who've been playing longer might have uh, and i do have a couple of those teams um that's uh so that's yeah that's all of the official teams uh, then there are also two uh, naf endorsed options that get some representation at tournaments so these are the slan roster um, which if you've played blood bowl 2 uh, the kids Lev team in that are a reskin of slan they were like originally frog people um and then also there's the old corn demons roster uh, which is the corn team from the first blood bowl video game uh, more or less, uh, and basically updated for the new edition. But that altogether, that's a total of 30 teams, which is a huge variety because each one of those teams offers you a very different way to play the game uh, and a different experience every time. Um, they're all specifically and deliberately not balanced, though. Some of the teams very definitely offer a much bigger challenge to use. Well, there's a tier system that sort of reflects this, but that's not necessarily the best way to categorise the teams, and we're probably not really going to talk about it that much. Different tournaments will have different things that they do with tiers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's out there. They're labelled uh, as, as tiers teams in the rulebook and in, in their other rules. It's not really going to figure much in what we talk about here. Though. But before we dive into the various options, though, there, that, so there might be some people uh, watching who've got hold of the second season box set and they've been watching through the series to get the hang of how to play and they'll be ready to go except that i said we'll have a quick look at these two teams in that set um, so if they're the only teams that you have you can get playing uh, equipped with an explanation of what those teams do um, if those teams don't interest you the next set, uh, section where we talk about good beginner teams is timestamp below if you want to just skip ahead um, but now i mentioned earlier these teams are not really ideal for learning the game with, but they are the ones that come in the box now. So I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people who do end up using one of them as their first team. Uh, first team I ever used uh, were Chaos, who are terrible for learning how to play the game with, but sort of managed somehow, got through, came to love the game. Um, so the reasons they're not great for learning the game uh, are that for, for the Blackhawks, they lean quite a bit into one style of play, which is hit stuff, hope it doesn't get up again, kick players while they're down and hope they don't get up again, uh, all while sort of shuffling the ball down the pitch. They don't really have any other options, no real finesse about them. So coaches who are new to the game aren't going to get to explore all the different rules that the game has to offer. Um, the Imperial, ability, uh, Imperial Nobility, they're quite similar to the human team that we've looked at already but they're just less effective. Like They're all round, just not quite as good. Like Their linemen and their throwers are worse than the human ones. They don't have catchers, but their blitzers have the catch skill, so they're sort of weird hybrid players. And then they have four blockers who all have the wrestle skill, which really isn't an ideal skill for a blocker. So they're just a bit weird. Like If you've played Blood Bowl 2, they're quite similar to the Bretonian team on there, but with fewer blitzers and the addition of throwers and the option for an ogre. Like, they're a pretty solid team. But probably uh, like more challenge than somebody who knew who's new to the game like really needs. Um, but as well as these things, like the two teams, um, they have five skills between them that are not all that core to the game, and we haven't mentioned them at all as yet. And so these are fend, stand firm, running pass, grab, and brawler. And two of those skills are completely new for this edition. And we are going to look through those as we look at the teams. So Imperial and Ability first. Like I said that they're linemen or worse than the human linemen. That's for two reasons. So the first is worse agility. They're only 4 plus on that. And the second is worse AV. So they're easier to injure on an 8 plus rather than the 9 plus of a human. Um, they do, as a trade-off, come with this skill called Fend, which is actually a really useful skill and it's often overlooked. Um, and what it does is that it prevents a player who blocks them from following up. Um, and that's it, really. But um, like if one of these linemen was a defender in a block, they get pushed back, even if that includes being knocked over, they can stop the attacker from following into their space. And that's optional, but if you decide not to use it, your opponent's basically going to see that as you wanting them to follow up, so he's probably not going to do it. Um, but there is, though, a skill in the game called Frenzy that compels the attacker to follow up and block again. And if you decide not to use Fens against those players, you can sort of pull them into trouble. And that takes quite a bit of learning how to read the board and like anticipate future actions to sort of call it right. 
um, but it is there as an option. Um, so fend like is it's a useful skill, and it's only really when you either use it or face a player with it, you sort of start to realise how useful it can be to deny areas of the pitch to your opponent. And with the nobility team having that on all their linemen, you get quite a lot of fend on the team, and you can start to use it in quite clever ways. Um, throwers, though, also worse than their human counterparts. So you might remember that a human thrower had a passing of 2+, plus. it's 3+, plus on the, the the nobility thrower, so just not as accurate. They also lack sure hands, which is a great skill to have on a thrower, and most throwers are probably going to want it at some point. Um, and they replace that with running pass, which has a very niche application. All it does is it allows them to keep on moving after they've thrown the ball, but only after they've thrown a quick pass. So it's definitely not as useful with sure hands. It's like the bottom line. And the nobility thrower is just objectively worse. Um, blitzers are the stars of the nobility team. You only get two of them. You used to get four in a Bretonian team if you want to see this team as a translation. Um, and the Blitzers are also 105k, which is expensive. Like if you compare that to the Human Blitzer at 85k, the only difference between them is you get the catch skill on the Nobility Blitzer, which just doesn't feel that much better to me. Um, like Block and Catch, they're both useful skills. Like We've covered what they do. Um, and they're the quickest players on the team at Movement 7, but they're so expensive for what you get compared to the Humans. Um, the next up, you get four Bodyguards, or up to four Bodyguards. So these are the blockers. They start with Wrestle. They're the only players in the entire game that start with Wrestle, like we mentioned earlier. Um, if you had the option with these guys, you're probably going to want to take Block rather than Wrestle um, because as they develop, a lot of what you want them to do involves them being on their feet. And if they have to keep wrestling players to the floor, they're going to spend a lot of time without a tackle zone, which is what they need to be most effective. So ideally, you'd want to have built them with Block instead of Wrestle, but having both skills of one player can be seen as a bit of a waste because they both sort of the, the, the times you'd want to choose between them it makes it a bit niche and it's probably a bit of a waste of a level um it is though like when these guys the blockers when they start developing they become serious and really useful players and this become clearer in part nine when we talk about player advancement but it's this primary access to strength skills that they have that really makes that um they do come with stand firm which is a strength skill itself and it's a really solid one and like fend it works when they're defender uh, when they're the defender on a block so Again, it's optional, but if you choose to use it, the opponent just can't push them back. Um, they just stay there, even if they're knocked over. And because they're not pushed back, there's nowhere to follow up to. But the Ogre is the final piece. It's exactly the same as the on the human team. Uh, so it's got Bonehead, it's got Lone of 4+, plus, which we haven't actually mentioned yet with the Ogre. And they do come with it, just like Journeyman do. It works the same way, so it's 4+, plus to use a reroll. Um, Mighty Blow plus 1, Thick Skull, Throw Teammate. Though the ability team doesn't have a halfling for the ogre to throw, so if you want to do that, you sort of need to find space in your inducements package for a right stuff player. I'm just going to mention it here. Um, in relation to the ability team, um, there is a skill in the game that counters both fend and stand firm, and it will cancel out its use. So if you're playing the ability, you're going to need to watch out for it because um, those two skills are quite fundamental to how the nobility team plays. Um, it's a skill called Juggernaut, um, which is a strength skill, and it only works on a blitz, so it's going to be once a turn at the most you're going to have to face it. Um, but it doesn't allow the defender of the block uh, or of the blitz to use Fend, Stand Firm, or actually Wrestle for that matter as well. Um, and the blitzing player also gets to treat a both down result as a pushback if they choose to. There aren't that many players out there that have it. Um, I think just one player on the corn team actually starts with it. Um, but it is a skill that you need to be aware of if you're playing nobility, because it can sort of undo what you're doing a bit defensively, um, and you need to watch out for it. It also pairs very nicely with the frenzy skill, because um, fend can be a bit of a shutdown for frenzy. But juggernaut is just something to be aware of if you're playing nobility. Right, Blackhawks. So, only three players to look at here. Because we've not looked at an Orc or Goblin team yet, we sort of don't have a lot to compare it to. We're going to be stretching for comparisons a bit. Um, start with the Blackhawks themselves. So you get up to six of them. And they're big boys, like they're slow, they're not agile, they can't throw the ball at all well, but they're strength four. And that's above average, and with six of them on the pitch, you can really sort of dominate physically. Um, so anyone who's ever played or played against lizard men are going to know exactly what I mean. Um, they also come with two really useful skills. So Brawler is new for this edition, and it makes blocking as the attacker a bit safer. Um, and they get to re-roll a single both down result when they take a block action. And this is specifically uh, a block and not a blitz, so... So they can't use it when they blitz. Um, the other skill, grab, uh, this changes the way that pushbacks work. So when they're the attacker for a block, push back an opponent, including knocking them over, they can choose any empty square adjacent to the defender to push them to, instead of just the three behind them. 
So this is, uh, in a way, well, it's not really like Fend, but it's a bit like Fend just in that way that it's really a sort of really low-key useful skill and its value sort of only really becomes apparent when you use it. Um, but that ability with the, the pushing back to different squares only works on a block, not a blitz. Um, but Grab has one other effect as well, which is to cancel out a skill called Sidestep. Um, and that works on both blocks and blitzes. Sidestep can be quite annoying, so Grab is a nice uh, key to unlock that. Goblin Bruisers, so these largely make up the rest of the team on the Blackhawk team, uh, and they're fairly similar to the Halfling that we looked at on the Human team. Um, they're a bit quicker though at movement 6, uh, and they're tougher than Halflings as well on AV 8+. plus. They also have the Thick Skull skill that we looked at in part 6, and this, like, combined with Stunty, is really interesting, because it means that they only get knocked out on an 8 rather than the usual 7 for a Stunty, so it drops that removable, removal rate like quite considerably. Um, they do still take a badly hurt on a roll of 9, though, just like any other Stunty. Um, but there are, we mentioned there were two other effects of Stunty, and as we're looking at a team and how they work, we should say what they are. Um, one of them, I think I got this the wrong way around uh, when I briefly mentioned it in part 6, but um, it makes it easier for opponents to interfere with a pass that they throw. So if a Stunty throws the ball, an opponent gets to try to interfere, they can add plus one to their roll. So it just makes uh, throwing with stunties over people's heads a bit more risky. And the other thing that stunty does is actually a positive thing, um, which is that they get to ignore tackle zones as they dodge. Um, not for the requirement to dodge, so like they still have to dodge every time they leave a square where they're marked by an opponent. Um, but they don't take any negative modifiers for tackle zones that they dodge into. So they're basically just always dodging on a 3+, plus and can squeeze through gaps uh, and just run straight through the line, which is a really useful ability to have. Um, but the big guy on the Blackhawk team is a trained troll, uh, and yet you do get untrained trolls as well. They play on the Orc team. Um, but the troll has like quite a similar sat line to the Ogre. It's a bit slower. He has agility 5+, plus instead of 4+. plus. But neither of those really hurt it that much because it's not that it's speed and agility on its strengths. Um, its low note is only at three plus, which is better, um, better than the ogre has because they get to use a team rerun on three plus instead of a four. But really stupid is a bit worse of a, neg uh, a nega trait than bonehead. Um, so if there's a teammate standing next to them, it's basically the same. It's two plus to activate them. Um, but if they're isolated, so no teammate standing next to them, that becomes a four plus to activate. Uh, and that teammate standing next to them can't also have the really stupid trait, and that just comes into effect when you get things like on Goblin and Snotling teams, you can get a pair of trolls, and they like can't help each other out with really stupid. So they need someone standing next to them to make them make them work effectively. Um, so a good way to play against trolls, like if you flip it round a bit, is to sort of try and isolate them, like push them away from their teammates, keep them on their own, and it can become quite easy to just play around the troll if you do that. Um, one more trait that the troll has that is different. Uh, is called projectile vomit um, which is new for this edition and you can do this instead of making a block with the troll so you, you you activate them and then instead of blocking you can vomit on your opponent so you just choose a target roll a d6 on a two, two plus you hit the target on a one the troll manages to hurl over itself um, but whoever's hit by it like hits uh, look, risks injury they're hit by it so you roll an armor roll and if you get through the armor then the player will go prone and the opponent makes an injury roll for them if the troll manages to injure itself, there's no turnover, which is a nice upside to the failure. Um, unless for some reason the troll was holding the ball, then you drop it and it's always a turnover when you drop the ball. But the rest, um, Mighty Blow, Regeneration, Throw Teammate, like we've looked at how they all work. The Goblin Bruisers have right stuff, so there are plenty of players that the troll can try to throw. Um, a key thing about Blackhawks um, is this ability here, so Bribery and Corruption, which shows up on a few teams pretty much any team that has goblins playing on it. Um, but this gives them a discount on the bribe inducements that we looked at back in part seven, because uh, they can buy them for 50K instead of the usual 100K. And this helps them sort of lean into a play style built around fouling, uh, the foul action specifically. Um, and a few other things on the Blackhawk team really help this too. So the changes to guard in this edition to aid with fouls and easy access to it for the Blackhawks and the troll. Um, grab on the Blackhawks so that you can push players over in a good position to sort of surround them, maximise foul assists. And the improvements to sneaky get in this edition as well, which like the Goblins have easy access to. All of these sort of add up to making the Blackhawk team probably the most effective fouling team in the game. And it's like well worth making the most of that with them. It's, it's a big part of how they play and how they're effective. Um, but so that's those two teams. Like if you were just watching this part because you're, they're the only two teams you have, you're looking to play your first game, you should have everything you need to do that now. Like everything else we're going to talk about can come later. So go get those first games in and see how you do. 
And so I've said right the way through this series that the two best teams to learn the game are the humans and undead. And I maintain that in the current rules, those are definitely the two I'd recommend. They're both hybrid teams. <clears throat> We're going to like talk about categorising the teams in a bit. Um, but they're both pretty flexible. They can do a bit of everything. Of the two, I'd say humans are sort of the pinnacle of being able to do everything to an OK standard because they have throwers and catchers, which gives them a good passing game. And for someone who's learning how to play the game, you sort of want to be able to try out all the different actions, see what the options are, see how the game works. Undead are going to tend towards a running game uh, rather than passing because they just don't have those specialist players to pass the boards effectively. So those are my two recommendations for someone new. Obviously, you don't have to start there if you don't want to, and there are some other options we're just going to look at quickly. So Orcs. Orcs are still a solid choice for a beginner. Uh, compared to humans, their throwing game is not quite as good. Like They have decent throwers, but because they don't have catchers, they sort of will tend a bit more towards running as well because catching the ball is less reliable than passing it for them. Um, they're also slower than humans, but they're tougher with like AV10 plus almost across the board. So they stick around and that makes them like quite forgiving to use. Um, if your players get knocked over, they're probably still going to be there next turn. They have some strength advantage in the big and blockers uh, and they can take four blitzers with blocks. So they're really solid for getting to grips with the game. What they've had added to them in this current edition is the animosity trait on almost all of their players. So like this means that if any of them want to hand off or pass the ball to one of the teammates who's listed with the trait, they have to make a two plus roll on a d6 first. And this can make moving the ball around quite tricky. And someone who's sort of just learning how to play the game sort of doesn't need that extra layer of complication and risk plus potential for frustration. Um, and it's a real shame that Orcs have that now. It's very really characterful. I think maybe it should always have been there with Orcs. Um, but it just moves them out of that ideal for beginner uh, sort of situation that they had before, and that they've always had. Um, I still like the Orc team though, um, and really, do Orcs need to pass the ball around that much? Maybe not. Uh, it's something you can work with, and it's something that Orc coaches will, will learn to adjust to. Um, you notice there is an untrained troll on this team, and just to flag up, the only difference from the Black Orcs trained troll is that the loner here is 4+, plus rather than 3+. plus. The rest of it is identical. Um, the goblins on this team, uh, these are the standard goblins, so this is a normal goblin. Goblin bruisers have thick skull, these goblins don't, they're otherwise the same. Um, and if we compare, just quickly, orc and human linemen, we can perfectly see the main difference in the teams. So the orcs move at 5 to the human 6, and his AV 10 plus to the human 9 plus, slower and tougher. Um, but let's look at an elf team, right, so of for elf teams i'd suggest dark elves are possibly the one that is most suitable for beginners just for one reason which is you can build a team to start with four blitzers and they all have the block skill um, the other elf teams you only get up to two of their blitzers but that, that's the maximum number of blitzers they can have um, elves are expensive though so you're probably going to only start with two re-rolls uh, starting with four blitzers on a dark elf team will mean that that's all you can afford with having to buy 11 players to start with so if you do insist on starting with an elf team, um, this is probably the most forgiving one to use just because of all the blocks that you can get in. But learning the game with elves can get you into bad habits a bit because they have agility 2 plus everywhere. And that can lead to you sort of developing a play style where you're happy to dodge or move the ball around with very little risk to it. And when you, like, like if and when you switch to other teams later on, you can sort of get a bit bitten by that because you realise that the way you're used to playing isn't so safe after all. And that's why I just think that learning the game with humans or undead with their like much more average stats, it's going to help you to properly appreciate the risks in the game, where it's not just two plus rolls everywhere to do whatever you like. So if you start with elves, like that's just something you have to look out for, because when you switch teams, it's not as safe as you think it is. Um, with dark elves, they also have a couple of players that are probably left until later before you start exploring them. So the witch elf is expensive. Uh, and has the frenzy skill, which is the one that we mentioned before that sort of forces you to follow up a block and then block again if the defender's still standing. Um, while you're still getting the hang of how the game works, frenzy can like get you into trouble uh, and lead you into dangerous blocks where the defender's going to be choosing the result of the dice. And it can take a bit of experience with the game, like developing good anticipation. Um, so it's probably not a great idea to like, use frenzy in your first game and just steam straight into that. Um, the assassin, uh, on the other hand, is just pretty rubbish. Like they're slightly better than in the, the rules, they're better than they used to be because their movement went up a bit and they got a little bit cheaper. But they're still just not very good. And if you're starting with Dark Elves, I'd, I'd go for the four blitzers, um, two re-rolls, a runner if, if you can afford it. I can't remember because things are a bit expensive, the current edition. I can't remember if you can still take a runner. Um, but just fill up with linemen up to 11 players. And the runner will give you a bit of extra speed if you can afford it. 
Um, but like a Dark Elf Lilo with their uh, Edge 2 Plus is just a good Blood Bowl player. There's loads you can do with them. So even if you have to go four blitzers, seven linemen, you're going to have a decent team. Um, if you want Elves with a better passing game, I'd suggest High Elves for beginners. Um, like all of the other Elf teams have throwers and catchers, but the High Elves are tougher with an AV of mostly nine plus. Um, Elven Union and Wood Elves have almost entirely AV eight plus, so they're really fragile and you can find yourself low on players quite quickly. Um, finally, with this team's for beginners bit, uh, we'll have a quick look at Dwarfs. Um, now, almost all of this team starts with block, and they also start with a set of really solid starting skills, which gives you a really good foundation to build a team with. Um, they have high, high AV, they have fixed goal everywhere, um, so like the Orcs, probably actually even more so than, than the Orcs, they're quite forgiving because it's hard to get their players off the pitch. Um, they're slow though, so there is like only one way that they play, which is a, just a slow grind up the pitch with no finesse at all. And of all the starting rosters, there isn't a single team who are more effective at the blocking side of the game as Dwarfs are. Um, and like we've learned in the game as Elves, you can kind of get into bad habits with that. So a one dice block with a Dwarf is basically a two plus roll to not turn over. And if you get into the habit of just throwing those regularly, you can come unstuck when you sort of switch teams later on. Because um, someone who learns a game playing Dwarfs and then switches to like Chaos is going to get caught out with turnovers from blocks. Because there is just like no sign of the block skill anywhere in a starting Chaos team. And if you learn the game playing Dwarfs and then throw loads of one dice blocks with Chaos, you're going to come unstuck. And it's because like that's just how you've learned to play the game. And obviously it's up to you which team you start with, like no one's going to stop you playing Dwarves. But if you do, you have to be aware of how risky the actions are that you're taking like with a normal team. Because like, if you don't, you're not really learning how to play the game as like the risk management simulator that it is. Or at least like you're not, you're, you're just learning like a specific and really narrowly focused version of the game. That's not going to do you any good when you play as other teams. And also with Dwarves, they have a frenzy player as well. Their Slayers come with frenzy. So... If you do start with Dwarfs, it might be a good idea to sort of try drafting a team initially without any Slayers in, just for the first couple of games, because you're going to be looking at trying to understand how tackle zones work, how assists for blocks work, uh, and Frenzy's going to force you to try and anticipate all of that a few steps ahead. And it can be enough to just try and keep up uh, when you just start playing the game and try to get a hold of those concepts. It's, it's a bit of a sort of situation where you like running before you can walk with blocking. So I'd highly recommend just give Frenzy a player's just give them a miss for your first couple of games. And definitely, like, if you, you want to start to play the game with a corn team, just don't do it. You're going to have a maximum of four players that don't have Frenzy. That's just asking for trouble. Um, like, So you've got options for good teams to start with, though. That is my opinion of the, the good ones, like one of those five. With a caveat for Elves and Dwarves, you're not going to learn proper appreciation of all of the risks of the game by doing it. And if you go with humans or undead, you will you will get the hang of that. You'll you'll get good variety in what you've got. You'll have players with block and without block. You'll see the difference of how that works. Um, you'll have proper experience of it as well. And agility three movement, the movement around the pitch and handing the ball off and stuff. It's a much more accurate version of how the game works. But like I said, like obviously no one's going to stop you playing what you want. Um, but I have seen players like one player in particular as an example you played Blood Bowl 2 of us during lockdown um, and against all advice they just decided they were going to learn how to play the game with a Nurgle team and they just had a really frustrating time of it because they just don't have any useful starting skills at all and ultimately like this player just didn't enjoy the game didn't stick with it but I think if they started with Orcs like maybe even Dwarfs like they'd have got that sort of bash style they were clearly looking for but with loads of block players as well and like sure hands on some players so that picking up the ball isn't such a chore and I think they'd have enjoyed the experience of learning the game much more if they'd just done that. Maybe they'd still be playing with us now as well. So these four categories on the screen here, they're a really helpful way to consider the 30 different teams that Blood Bowl offers. Um, there are teams, tiers for teams as well. With a recent rules update, it sounds like Games Workshop are going to sort of see those as adjustable because um, they've moved some teams around based on tournament performances. Um, but when you're considering what team you want to play, it's probably better to look at a play style rather than sort of a perceived effectiveness. Because um, if you're going to enjoy the game, you've got to play it in a way that you think you're going to enjoy it. And what the different teams offer you aren't necessarily just different levels of challenge, but different, completely different ways of playing the game. So go with a style that you think you're going to enjoy it, I think, first of all. And we're not going to look into all 30 teams in detail. That would be insane and too long. Um, but just some of the broad groupings and differences. Um, there's another episode of the Bonehead podcast that I'm going to recommend, link below again, um, where they, they run through all the teams and describe each of them in under a minute. 
So they spend about half an hour doing it. It's quite a fun episode, uh, and it will give you a nice overview of all the teams, just with that really quick description of every team. But let's look at Stunties first, because these are the easiest category to define. So this is Halflings, Goblins, Snotlings, and Ogres. Um, stunty teams are made up entirely from players with the Stunty trait, and uh, like a big guy type player who's a high strength player with some sort of negative trait that reduces their reliability or effectiveness. So we've looked at like Bonehead on Ogres and really stupid on Trolls. Um, so just quickly for the differences, Halflings individually are really poor players, but they get positionals who can throw and catch the ball. They can also take two tree men who are slow and high strength that can throw Halflings around. Um, goblins, who are my favourite stunty team, can take a pair of trolls uh, and also pack their team with secret weapons. So if you like the sound of bombs and chainsaws, you can maybe give them a look. Um, snotlings can take a pair of trolls as well. but They also get up to two pump wagons, which are also quite hard hitting. Um, the snotlings themselves are sort of even weaker versions of goblins, but being smaller, they're even better at dodging than other stunties are. And then ogres are a bit different in that their focus is all on the six ogres that you get to take. Um, the rest of the team is made up of Noblars, which are basically exactly the same as Snotlings. So that's Stunties out of the way, uh, and they're all sort of outliers, really. Like They're the most challenging teams to use, uh, and in the sort of official tiers, they make up the lowest tier. The rest of the teams all sort of fit onto a spectrum from sort of bash at one end, like the physically dominant teams, to finesse teams on the other end, um, who are like high agility, high speed. Um, but they'll broadly fit into these categories, with hybrid being sort of middle ground between them. Um, so let's start with the Bash End, um, and this is Orcs, Dwarfs, Chaos, Nurgle, Corn, Corn Demons, Chaos Dwarfs, and Tomb Kings. Hello, uh, this is Future Glenn with a bit of a drop-in. Uh, so while I was editing this, I decided that I wanted to add another team to this Bash list, which is Black Orcs. Um, now, I went a bit back and forth on Black Orcs, because they got loads of stunties in the team, which doesn't suggest Bash. Um, and they're also uh, often considered to be like... A slower version of the lizard men team uh, and lizard men are a hybrid team but it's that being slower than them which is the key difference so the speed that lizard men have it gives them another dimension to their play it means they can be a bit more flexible <laughs> like we already said about the black orcs um that they can only really play in that one way which is about physical dominance and it's about bullying the opposition um, and the, the goblins are there have a part of that as well because it fits into that uh them, them sort of excelling at the fouling side of the game um and and that's what they do really um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that in. Obviously as well, uh, I did mention this in the original recording, but the um, these categories of teams, they're quite subjective. It's just how I fit, they fit, feel that they fit in. Um, but yeah, it's sort of broad categories, which hopefully helps to explain a bit how they play. Um, I mentioned Blackhawks again in a few minutes, uh, just, just in a list of names in hybrid teams. Just ignore and pretend they're not there. I really think Blackhawks fit into the Bash team uh, much better. So the two corn teams, they're like the weird ones here, and it's just because they just have so much frenzy packed into them. Uh, and this makes them a really challenging team to play with, because um, there's just a lot of risk in using frenzy, especially while you're learning the game. Uh, and it can really help you come unstuck, like no matter how, uh, no matter how experienced you get at the game, really. Um, but a couple of these teams sort of can be developed to be a bit better at the ball side of the game than the others. So Orcs have decent throwers, uh, and they have the potential to build catchers out of goblins but it's not really how they're most effective. And similarly, you can build Chaos players, like particularly with mutations, to be sort of really good at handling the ball. But again, it's just not how they're most effective. Like really you play one of the teams on this list because they're good at the blocking side of the game and they're about dominating the space on the pitch, bullying the opposition and trying to take the, the opposition off the pitch by injuring them. It's like unsubtle and when it works, uh, it's not really much of a challenge because you're just left with no opposition to play against. All of the teams tend basically to not have a plan B though. And when plan A doesn't work, it can be a struggle to get anything else going because you just don't have any other options. And a finesse team is just going to run rings around you. We'll skip over hybrid for now and we'll look at the finesse or agility team. So this is the other end of the spectrum. Um, and you'll notice a bit of a pattern with these first four. So we've got high elves, wood elves, dark elves, elven union, who are sometimes called pro elves, uh, and skaven. So it's, it's just the four elf teams plus Skaven, those five teams. We've mentioned before that all the elves have agility 2+, plus, so they're sort of obviously in this category. But then you have Skaven, and they only get four agility 2+, uh, plus players. But these four players, uh, gutter runners, they're what you build a Skaven team around. It's just all about them and the rest of them are supporting casts. And gutter runners also, you may remember, the fastest players in the game at movement 9. 
Um, Skaven do have throwers as well, and they're very good throwers with passing 2+, plus, pass and sure hands. But with the changes to passing in this edition, we're probably going to see more of them. And because passing used to just be based on agility, they were often sort of missed out, because the gutter runners were already very capable of throwing the ball. Um, but as well as this, they have three fairly heavy hitters in the two blitzers and the rat ogre. So block, frenzy, mighty blow, and easy access to strength skills as they level up gives this team a bit of punch with those players. Um, if we are thinking about this as a spectrum, it's probably the Skaven and the Dark Elves that sit closest to the bash end out of these five. Um, but it's not really going to be their focus, and they're going to struggle to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a bash team, and will probably lose that matchup if that's how they try to play it. So these teams are just all about making the most of their speed, their agility, and the passing game to just keep away from their opponents and outscore them. Dark Elves are the one team here that don't have a thrower. Um, they can build uh, their runner with passing 3+, plus, like as a thrower if they want to. Um, but really, if you want a passing game, you're better off looking elsewhere. Um, so High Elves are the toughest of the passing teams. They've got excellent catchers and they've got the best thrower in the game. Um, and they're also one of the most expensive teams to recruit and it leaves you having to cut back somewhere, starting either low on re-rolls or low on good players. The other two Elf teams are quite fragile um, and it's difficult to keep their players on the pitch. Um, especially if you're constantly giving up blocks. Um, Wood Elves are faster uh, and Pro Elves are cheaper. So Pro Elves, Elven Union, they do have the best catchers in the game. Um, they come with Nerves of Steel, which allows them to ignore tackle zones when they throw or catch the ball, which is amazing in really tight situations. Um, but the Wood Elves have the best blitzers in the game uh, in the shape of their war dancers. Wood Elves are also like they're the only Elf team that gets a big guy because um, they have access to a tree man. Um, they don't have any teammates to throw, but they give you a point to sort of anchor your line around. Um, so those are the finesse teams. They all take a bit more thought to get the best out of them, set, certainly compared to bash teams where it's just hit stuff. Um, but like their high speed uh, and their high agility sort of gives you access to plays that other teams just can't pull off. Um, now the hybrid teams, this is basically, it's everyone who's left. Uh, and I'm not going to read the list out. There are 13 of them though. Uh, they're all on the screen here. Um, and we can kind of continue this idea of a spectrum from bash to finesse, and all of these are going to fit along there somewhere. Humans are probably going to be the most finesse team out of this list, because um, they have catchers and they have throwers, uh, and that gives them that sort of side to their game. With an ogre and four blitzers as well, like they can play the physical game, like they, they can flip to do that. Especially if they're playing a finesse team, they'll probably try and outblock them. Um, like Undead, Necromantic, Black Orcs, Norse and Lizardmen are all going to be much more towards the bash side of things. They sort of don't have a lot of agility, though some of them do have some quick players. And they're going to tend to try and sort of dominate physically. But really, any of these teams can sort of have a go at any play style, and they can adapt a bit to play around their opponent's weaknesses. That's not like universal among these. Humans are the best example of that. But these teams are all like pretty flexible, and you don't get stuck with just one way to play the game. One thing to look out for with hybrid teams is their skill coverage. Um, we are going to talk more about skills in the next one, uh, next part, part nine. Um, but the Norse and Amazon teams are like really good examples of this. Um, they have almost universal access to general skills. Um, they both have throwers that can take passing skills, catchers who can take agility skills, and blitzers, uh, or Ulf Werners and Berserkers for Norse, that can take strength skills. And like outside of mutations, which are a bit of a special case anyway, like these teams can sort of do everything. There's like a player for every task on these teams. And that sort of sums up hybrid teams, really. You're not going to get that many players who can just do anything you want, but you do have a tool for every job. And it's like a case of learning how to fit them all together and get them to work together. Um, so that's really it with like this intro for teams. Um, the best way to work out what teams you like, though, is just give them all a try. Like You can listen to or read other people's thoughts on them as much as you'd like. There's like no real replacement for a few games with a team to see what you think of them. So like, use this as a bit of a starting point. Try out a few and see what you think.